Well, hello, it's Dr. Lucas, and I want us to uh, think about the Apostle Paul as a, uh, a man from two cities. And we, we want to just uh, briefly kind of touch upon this as, uh, as we go through uh, Paul's life here. Now, Acts 21, 37 through 22, 28 lists three major influences on the life of Paul, his Roman heritage and its citizenship. I mean, it's kind of quite amazing that as you look at Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, all of his letters written to churches and even to individuals, Paul doesn't mention his citizenship. We only find that in the book of Acts, but that becomes very important, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. He also has his Jewish heritage with its religious influences. Uh, we, we know that, uh, that we're told in Philippians that uh, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He, he was able to uh, speak and write Hebrew, which was quite uncommon at day and time. Uh, we, we know that uh, he had studied under a major rabbi, Gamaliel, in Jerusalem. And, and so this becomes his worldview. And then the third influence on his life is the Greek heritage. Growing up somewhat in Tarsus, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but he would have been influenced by the uh, uh, perhaps by the the uh, philosophies and, and the education that he might have received there as well. Uh, all of these are important uh, things for us to uh, to think about. And in order to demonstrate it, first of all, his Judaism uh, was an influence on his life, then his his Greek culture and his Roman culture. And uh, those three areas where, where they would all meet uh, would, would help us understand something about this man, Paul. Now, by way of introduction, his Roman heritage, he owed the legal protection that went with him. We've already mentioned, we only know about this in the book of Acts. But, uh, but when he get in trouble, he was able to appeal to that. Philippians got really upset when they found out that he was a Roman citizen and they had beaten him. It's Jewish heritage. He owed his faith and perspective on life. Again, that worldview. And then this Tarsian heritage, his Greek in influence here was a Greek culture and orientation. Now, this map tells us a little bit about uh, his journeys, and we're not going to spend much time here, but uh, but you can see that the the, uh, the blue indicates his uh, his first journey, the uh, pink indicates the second journey, and uh, and then the uh, uh, third journey is the red, and then finally the fourth uh, journey is the, uh, or not really a fourth journey, but is uh, his trip to Rome, uh, where he will uh, stand in front of Caesar. Now let's think about Tarsus here. This is one of the major cities that might have influenced him. Scholars are divided over how much influence he really gets from Tarsus, uh, partly because we don't know how long he stayed there. Uh, we, we know that the population of Tarsus during Paul's days is estimated to be around one half million, 25, million uh, 25 miles north of the Sicilian gates. There's a main passage between Syria and Asia Minor that was chiseled out of stone. Can you imagine that? And we know that Tarsus was a major city of trade and commerce during the time of the Apostle Paul. Uh, we, we know that they had, uh, uh, had uh, hospitals and, and they had universities, so a very a cosmopolitan city. And excuse me, but there's actually a fly buzzing around here. Now, a brief history of Tarsus, it became a, a city, a polis under Seleucid kings. You got to go all the way back to, uh, to the intertestamental period. And uh, it had a measure of freedom and independence. Greek language was the common tongue. It was the language that everybody spoke. And Greek institutions sprung up here as well. You had uh, baths and gymnasiums, marketplaces, Greek architecture. And so it becomes a very Hellenistic culture uh, for that city. Now, under the Romans, Rome created a province of Cilicia in 102 BC. Tarsus was not included in this at first and kept a Greek city state, uh, Greek city status. Now, the, the uh, Roman general Pompey in 67 BC expanded the territory, added Syria and Phoenicia as a part of the Roman province until AD 72. Antony declared this city a free Roman city around 42 BC. Remember, Antony and Cleopatra it was during that time. The privileges of a free city, they made their own laws. They were self-governing, exempted from some heavy provincial taxes. Israel paid heavy taxes because uh, they were not, uh, you know, free. And it's a free city when Paul grew up in the city of Tarsus. 
Now his family, now tradition from Jerome, uh, a uh, uh, kind of, uh, lived about 400 or so, and a translator of the uh, uh, Latin Septuagint says that Paul migrated to Tarsus from Gishala in Judea when the Romans were laying waste. And uh, there's a couple of problems with that. Gishala is in Galilee, but Judea is often refers to all of Israel. So that's not really that big a problem. Acts 22.3 says that Paul tells the crowd that he was born in Tarsus. So perhaps uh, uh, Paul's family went to Tarsus before his birth. And you can see where Gishla is located, just north of the Sea of Galilee, uh, just a, uh, uh, a, a very major fortification at one time. Now, his family is what's known as diaspora or diaspora Jews. What does that mean? Well, anybody who lives outside of Israel since the Babylonian captivity is known as diaspora or the, uh, the, the separated ones, the uh, uh, ones who are living outside of Israel. The synagogue is the major institution for community life. Everything revolves around it. Religious instruction took place on a regular basis, weekly. And uh, for some boys and girls, uh, especially the boys, uh, every day they would go to, uh, uh, to the synagogue for, uh, for education. They would read scriptures and they would pray. And I imagine this, young Jewish boys learned the, uh, large portions of the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They memorized those in Hebrew. Can you imagine that? Now, the religious education. Paul learned much of his education from his home. The parents undertook that responsibility to teach. And one thing we know is certain, he learned his Greek Bible well, the Septuagint. You'll see that LXX that's in blue. Uh, that's the abbreviation for the Septuagint. If we had time, I'd talk about the Septuagint. Uh, but it uh, was translated beginning about 300 B.C. Uh, from uh, uh, Hebrew to Greek. And so it's the, uh, he, the Greek Old Testament. His education from about 6 to 14, he went to primary education schools where he learned reading, writing, arithmetic, music as well. And uh, only three times again does Paul show knowledge of Greek poets, Acts 17, 22, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and Titus 1, 12. Again, his primer was the Septuagint, uh, which are not a Greek uh, and not Greek writers. Okay, he learned the Greek Old Testament. His Jewish education, as I said earlier, was under Gamaliel in Jerusalem, probably about 14 to 18 uh, A.D. It's questionable whether he studied rhetoric formally or not, but he was very familiar with it, familiar with Stoic, Cynic, street philosophers and their oral, oral styles. Now, his Greek cultural influences, we know he was exposed to some Greek things like gymnasiums, Greek athletics, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. He mentions foot racing, boxing, training for competition. Philippians 3, 12 to 14, he talks about a runner. 1 Timothy 4, 8, he talks about physical training, the good fight, winning the race. And so he may have even had a love for sports as a result of Tarsus. Also, uh, he was exposed to mystery religions. And uh, we wonder if his theology might have been heavily influenced by these Mr. Religions. Most of us uh, don't believe that, but there was a time where, where a lot of uh, scholars just uh, insisted on this. Uh, Greece, the Greek oldest uh, were all, would be the Eleusian religion. Asia Minor had Dionysius with roots to Mother Goddess. Dionysius is related to Bacchus, the god of wine. Persia has Mithraism, Egypt has Isis and Osiris. All were generally just nature fertilities. Some common features of these mystery religions, they celebrated the dying and coming to life of the seasonal cycles of nature. By Paul's day, they had been uprooted from the places of origin and universalized, called mystery because they had secret rites which guaranteed immortality. They promised protection and deliverance on an individual level. Quite often, people joined these religions because they, uh, they, they just guaranteed that when you died, they would take care of your body. Now, the charges against Paul that he turned Christianity into a virtual mystery religion, uh, thinking about the Lord's Supper as a cultic meal. You know, uh, Jesus had said, you're, you're to take my body and eat. This is my blood, drink. And, and Paul developed off of that, like in 1 Corinthians 11. 
Baptism traced to a terror, bolim, going back to the killing of a blood, bathing in the initiate in the blood, and even calling Jesus Lord and Savior goes back to Roman gods, and I wish we had time to really develop this to a, to a greater degree. Now, responsive without a doubt, Paul encountered those pagan mystery religions from an early age, but it seems they contribute nothing to his religious thinking. The content of his faith is that Septuagint, that Greek Old Testament, and the conviction that Jesus was the risen Messiah. These uh, philosophers that Paul would have uh, encountered, Acts 17, 16 to 21, depicts Paul holding his own with the Epicurean Stoic philosophers in Athens. He appears to be very acquainted with the Stoics and the Cynics. Wealth moved around, they used similar methods of argumentation and they emphasized moral teaching. The Cynics were the original street preachers. They abandoned all luxuries, living lives of poverty. They dressed in ragged clothes, depended on begging for sustenance, and they were known for their sharp social critique. The Stoics were the most popular philosophers of the day. They sought to be detached from the world and to be totally sufficient. They saw that as the greater virtue. They believed the, the world was held together by a rational being that every person possessed this spirit, and, and they participated in divinity. They emphasized living in harmony with nature and fellow man because of the divine in men. This was very popular for, with the military for some reason. Now, Stoicism was a major influence of Tarsus at one time. He used their style of argumentation known as the diatribe, which is arguing by use of rhetorical questions. It often sets up a straw man as a partner to ask the question in rapid succession. Romans 6 1 is a good example. They also uh, involve st uh, Stoic moral instruction. We see Paul stressing it too in his list of vices and virtues, virtues out of Galatians 5, 19 to 20, fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The form is similar, but the content is quite different. So the greatest legacy owed to Tarsus was the exposure to Gentiles, which he never would have encountered in Jerusalem, not to that degree. So it's no accident that a diaspora Jew would be asked to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Remember, diaspora means the scattered ones, the separated ones. The second influence is Rome. Uh, politically, Paul's world was Roman. Only areas not under Roman rule was out of the Parthians and to, uh, to the east of Syria and the Barbian tribes north and of eastern Europe. Within Rome's borders, there was relative peace. Its administration of these various areas took various shapes, but the one constant was the Roman presence. Now, Rome's world, Paul grew up in a world ruled by Rome. Tarsus was a measure of independence and self-governing. The Syrian legate, uh, legate was over Tarsus. While in Jerusalem, he had the Roman procurator in charge, residing in Caesarea in the Mediterranean, and Roman church permanently stayed in Jerusalem. His Roman citizenship was a coveted right. As I mentioned here, he never mentions those in his epistles, but you find it in Acts 16, Acts 22, and Acts 23, uh, where he needs to appeal to these. What are the citizenships, uh, privileges of Roman citizenship? One, they're subject to Roman law and not local laws of the provincial cities. Second, they could agree to trial by local law, but they always retain the right to be heard before a Roman tribunal and only a Roman citizen had the right to marry another Roman citizen. Number four, a citizen could not be imprisoned or scourged without a hearing and sufficient cause, which is what got the, the Philippians in trouble. In capital offenses, a citizen had the right to appeal the decision of a lower court to the emperor, which is what the apostle Paul did. And in general, they're exempt from cruel punishment like crucifixion. Now, the Roman government here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the emperor is called the principus, the first in command, just like we call our president commander in chief. You had two different kinds of territories, imperial and senatorial. Imperials controlled by the uh, emperor, senatorial by the senate. Uh, Proconsul served one year, generally more stable, appointed by the senate. Gallio in Corinth was proconsul in AD 52. Procurators could serve indefinitely and were appointed by the emperor. Clank kingdoms existed. Israel inherited the great were clank kingdoms. During Paul's life, Israel ruled procurators except for the three-year 
period of Herod's grandson, Herod Agrippa I. And we know that Paul had dealings with two Roman governors, Felix and Festus. Roman free cities based on the Greek model of the independent city-state. Roman policy was to allow as much freedom as possible as long as you were loyal to Rome and you paid your provincial taxes and uh, you were allowed, to, uh, the, these cities were allowed to tax themselves, allowed to determine their own government. And the good thing is no uh, Roman troops would be within your city limits. You had some cities, uh, colonies like Philippi, the highest status of cities in the empire. They were little islands of Roman culture. They enjoyed self-government, exemption from those taxes. Only Roman citizens voted and ran the government. And troops and veterans were stationed in these cities to help maintain peace. The Roman political system, you can see in this chart, Caesar, the imperial provinces. You had a legate and a prefect or procurator like Assyria and Galatia and Judea. Senate, you have the uh, proconsul or, or uh, uh, pro, uh, proprator. Uh, you have like Achaia, Asia, Bithynia, Crete, Cyprus, and Macedonia. Roman military legions were in the imperial provinces. A basic units of legion, five to 6,000 personnel. Augustus had 25 to 32 legions. You basically have two kinds of officers, nobility and career. The nobility were high ranking and career were lower ranking. The uh, legate was over the legion. He entered directly to the governor of the province, and each legate had six tribunes. Now, the Roman military men, you have two different types again. The Roman legion and the republic in early imperial periods made up of only Roman citizens, and nobility took the higher positions, and the plebeians, common people, the lower. The second, auxiliary soldiers were largely the non-citizens drawn from natives of the province in which the legion was located and you had other mercenaries. The Roman army divisions, you had smallest unit was a legion, squadron of, of uh, eight soldiers, then 10 squadrons made the centuria. The centurion was his commander. Largest division of the legion was a cohort. There were 10 cohorts in the legion, and Cornelius was a centurion, mentioned in Acts 10. Now, these uh, no legions are stationed in Italy or the senatorial provinces. The only forces in Italy are the Praetorian Guard who guard the emperor. And Paul mentions them in Philippians 1.13. And here you see a chart. I'm not going to spend any time on it. Roman travel was a byproduct of the Roman military, vast road system, let them move uh, quickly from one place to another. By the end of the first century, there were over 50,000 miles of paved primary roads uh, via Augusta, via Appia, via Ignatia, or some of those. Travel by sea was common as well. I mean, if you can imagine, there's 50,000 miles of paved Rome in ancient Israel in the first century. In the United States, we have something like, I think it's like 40 to 42,000 miles of interstate. They had more than we do. And these, this is a list of some of the references and credits that I looked at to uh, prepare this, uh, this lecture. Hey, I'm praying for you. God bless you.